It is now time to award our inaugural Ronald T. and Gayla D. Farah and Media and Civil Rights History Award. We are so honored to have Dr. Farah here today to present the award to Gordon Mantler of Duke University. I'd like to take just a moment to say a few words about Dr. Farah. He spent 15 years in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications as both a professor and an ABLE administrator. You can read more about him on page nine of your programs, but let me say this about him. Although I did not have the pleasure to work with Ron, many of our current faculty did. And I'm not kidding when I say they still speak with reverence whenever his name is mentioned. If I mention his name, they always pause and go, oh. And so he's highly regarded here in the school. They also speak of his kindness, his expertise, his drive, and his determination to succeed and to make the school a better place. Thank you, Ron, for helping us to launch the Media and Civil Rights Symposium. And now, Dr. Farah, if you would come and present the Ronald T. and Gayla D. Farah Media and Civil Rights History Award. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, and, and uh, those uh, good things that you said uh, probably at some point originated with me, so I'm not <laughs> sure. The academy lost a good teacher, but our kids got a terrific mom. Gayla liked students. Lord knows she fed enough of them over the years in our house. Uh, uh, literally hundreds. Uh, we, 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 we rarely had a holiday without students, no, usually foreign students there. And she was a wonderful listener, and students confided in her at great length. At, at the end of one party, a, a student came up to say goodbye, and he said, uh, Dr. Farah, your wife is very perspective. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think, Gayla was happy being a faculty wife, but a great many faculty wives and faculty husbands uh, are said to be unhappy. There have been studies about this. And one reason is because they thought when they married a faculty member that their life would be keg parties and ball games and <laughs> receptions at the president's house and endless vacations. Um, they found out instead that their faculty spouse was frantically working nights and weekends on research or correcting papers or figuring out what he was going to say in class the next day. Uh, my point to all this is that, is that faculty wives put up with an awful lot and, uh, and maybe aren't appreciated as much as they should be and this award is one modest step in acknowledging that fact. The main thing here is though to honor the awardee. Now I didn't pick the topic, uh, Kathy and Ken who else on the committee picked the topic, and I didn't pick the winner. Some out-of-state judges did that. But I'm delighted with the decision. Uh, civil rights reporting. My wife and I grew up in the segregated South. My wife was not a crusader, but she despised injustice. And she was very proud of the role that journalism played in exposing injustice, particularly in our part of the country. The heroes at our house were uh, Barry Bingham in Louisville and Hodding Carter, Carter Sr. in Greenville and Ralph McGill in Atlanta and Jonathan Daniels in Raleigh and my old boss, Harry Ashmore in Little Rock. Civil rights journalism has done a very great deal for this country. And I know Gayla would be proud and honored, as I am, at this gesture to recognize and appreciate it. Not all, now having said that, not all civil rights reporting is excellent or holds up well under thoughtful scrutiny. This year's winner 
Lord Manla has provided us with a fine example of it. His essay published last spring was entitled, The Press Did You In? In the piece, he makes a persuasive case that press coverage of a significant story, the story he chose was the Poor People's Campaign of 1968, actually reinforced some simplistic and, and, and unfair uh, stereotypes. In his words, his story, quote, was just another chapter of the black free struggle. And he made the point that there were other poor people too, uh, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans, and actually poor white kids. It's not a happy piece, by the way, but I think it suggests that American journalism has taken a forward step when civil rights reporting can be subjected to critical scrutiny. So presenting this award to Gordon is a joyous occasion for my family and me. And by the way, if I had known he was going to turn out so well, I'd have been nicer to him when he was a student here. <laughs> Today, I want to, uh, I would like to present an abbreviated version uh, of the winning article and, and tie it to my larger book project. <clears throat> the Poor People's Campaign of 68, uh, the early Rainbow Coalition in 1969 and 1970, which is uh, Fred Hampton's Rainbow Coalition, not Jesse Jackson's that comes uh, 15, 20 years later, um, and the efforts of Southwestern uh, farm workers and land-grant rights activists to partner with black power advocates between 1967 and 1970 <clears throat> all demonstrated the great potential of such collaboration to the point that many of the organizers believed that nothing less than a revolution was at hand. But as they discovered, a shared history of oppression can only take them so far. Blacks and ethnic Mexicans, it turned out, viewed their poverty somewhat differently. Issues overlapped, but were not exactly the same. Conflicts and disagreements seemed inevitable. So rooted in both st stylistic and ideological differences, these conflicts have begun to receive some scholarly attention. Yet another factor played a tremendous role in the limited and overlooked influence of such coalitions, these multiracial coalitions beyond black and white, uh, and largely have gone unnoticed. That factor is the role of the media, uh, which prompts a number of questions that animate both my article and the larger book project. Specifically, how did the media frame multiracial coalitions uh, for, for public consumption in this era? And how has this framing affected our understanding of the history since? Did journalists just exacerbate already existing tensions between these groups, uh, or did they introduce something new, perhaps inadvertently, that hindered these efforts from the start, or perhaps both? So to make some sense of these questions, <clears throat> um, I want to take us back to the spring in 1968 uh, during the Poor People's Campaign on the Washington Mall. And I'm going to get a sip of water. <clears throat> the Reverend Hosea Williams was frustrated. For months, he and other activists had thrown everything they had into the people's campaign. In what turned out to be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s last crusade, the campaign aimed to reinvigorate the poverty by transforming the black freedom struggle into a broader <clears throat> multiracial movement for human rights. But the national media, in many organizers' eyes, seemed determined to tear down the campaign. During one afternoon briefing in early June 1968, Williams had had an stepped in front of those assembled and simply erupted and accused them of participating in, quote, a conspiracy to poison the mind of America by exaggerating the campaign's shortcomings and ignoring its accomplishments. Quote, said what? They sneak around like an underground assassin looking for dirt and filth. Williams then turned to class. They go around, quote, around with their bellies filled with food like a bigot filled with hate, who go home at night to their big houses and plush carpets while we die of exposure to the weather. 
Are you part of the system? Are you promoting it? Now, Hosea Williams, a veteran organizer with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, originally from Savannah, had been working with Dr. King for years, um, was known for his bluster. Um, these kinds of interrup uh, eruptions occurred several times during the spring. <clears throat> but later that month, when the campaign neared collapse, other organizers echoed this frustration, albeit in less colorful language. The press never did get into the real substance of why we were here, lamented Tom Offenberger, the SCLC's director of public information and a former reporter himself. The press is ready to write a story about something they can see with their own eyes and don't have to interpret or understand much concluded the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, SCLC president and successor to Dr. King, if people could pay as much attention to the demands of the poor as what was going on in Resurrection City, the campaign could get somewhere. Resurrection City is, this is the part of the Washington Mall, Resurrection City is here on the left. Here are buildings that no longer exist actually on the mall. This is all open space. <clears throat> So Resurrection City became the most enduring symbol of the campaign. When King and his aides first conceived of building a tent city on the Washington Mall, they foresaw it playing a far different role than what the National Daily Press actually portrayed. SDLC organizers imagined the city as not only of unity, nation's poor, but also a pragmatic space to house protesters, launch marches, demonstrations, and if need be, massive civil disobedience. The encampment would remain until the public and Congress either heard and acted upon the poorest pleas for respect and assistance, or risk a more disruptive campaign at the presidential nominating conventions later that summer. Although it held about 2,500 people at its peak and sported, sported uh, a dynamic uh, energy that one writer described as, quote, a revival meeting within a carnival within an army camp, a great description, I think. Um, Shantytown was ravaged by disorganization and poor weather. By the time crews uh, demolished the tent city in late June, six weeks after it rose, National Daily Press reports depicted Resurrection City as a filthy and violent blemish on the otherwise pristine National Mall. Now, rather than garner sympathy for the nation's poor, the Shantytown became a deterrent to such feeling, as well as a burden to those organizers trying to maintain it. The campaign, despite being far more than just Resurrection City, quickly faded after the tent city's demise. Several factors helped doom the campaign. As historians point out, Ralph Abernathy and his aides shared the blame for the campaign's ignominious end. Design is an event for media consumption. With the nation's largest report at hand, the campaign was highly disorganized without a clear, consistent message. Part of this disorganization can be attributed to the violent death of King and the leadership vacuum Abernathy, Andrew Young, Jesse Jackson, and others attempted to fill. The public's deep skepticism toward any poor people's movement proved a particularly great obstacle, as did a dirty tricks operation conducted by the FBI and the local police. But none of these arguments consider seriously the role of the national media, especially in influencing SCLC's own attempts at generating good publicity. Mainstream journalists' ability to, quote, frame the campaign as they saw fit place an enormous amount of power in the hands of a few largely unsympathetic observers. As many here at the conference have discussed, and um, I, I also uh, cite Todd Gitlin and his research on uh, the New Left, uh, the press produced media frames of the area's social movements, not a mirror of reality. The era's mostly white, male, middle-class press corps constantly placed the social movements of the time in easily digestible, predetermined bits for the public, emphasizing the threat of violence and conflict, its potential at least, formal male leadership, and organization and style over substance. Now, as recent scholarship on the press and the black freedom struggle demonstrates, uh, such framing could be very beneficial. In their much-deserved Pulitzer Prize-winning study, the race beat former reporters Gene Roberts and H Hank Klebanoff portrayed as playing an active role in publicizing the the South's racial caste system. From the Emmett Till lynching in 1955 to Bloody Sunday in Selma ten years later, journalists aided civil rights activists again and again in the fight to turn public opinion against Jim Crow by highlighting white violence uh, against mostly black nonviolent protesters. Some of this assistance even came in the form of journalists' own physical sacrifices, being beaten, being threatened, 
their equipment being destroyed. Others have made similar points. Yet while we should recognize these sacrifices and that the movement's narrow framing through the threat of real and imagined blood made a contribution, the focus on violence oversimplifies the movement. Loss were the not nuts and bolts of the organizing, including the painstaking developments of relationships, personal and inter interpersonal relationships, the centrality of women, and the daily sacrifices made by civil rights workers and their allies. Moreover, our lionization of journalists reinforces uh, or, um, the movement's traditional 1955 to 1965 narrative that emphasizes only black and white Southerners and an obsession with conflict and an internal dissent. Such emphases disregard the considerable activism and coalition building after 1965 and outside of the South, especially the Poor People's Campaign. So an analysis of the media's relationship with the campaign proves instructive. Campaign coverage demonstrates how media framing inherently flattens out the complexities of the era's nascent interracial and multiracial anti-poverty coalition building, of which the campaign was the most prominent example. I examined campaign coverage by three kinds of media, what I would call the national print press, the New York Times, LA Times, the Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, Atlanta Journal Constitution, as well as the three primary news magazines, Time, Newsweek, and the US News. Um, the mainstream black press, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, da Defender and Daily Defender, <clears throat> uh, Amsterdam News, Afro-American, uh, and Jet Magazine. And then what I would call the alternative or underground press, the Chicano Press Association, which was a coalition of um, 20 or, or 30 uh, Spanish language, usually bilingual uh, newspapers um, that came out monthly when they had the money, um, as well as the leftist newspapers, The Worker, uh, and People's World, and the Liberation News Service. So I looked at all of these to kind of figure out what the coverage was different or the same. Um, and I looked at these publications between August 1967 and <clears throat> when King first hinted at a major new it didn't have the, the Poor People's Campaign. It wasn't really fully developed, but he, he talks about it at his at the last that he attends in August 67. And July 1968, when Ralph Abernathy left Washington to read and campaign to the, uh, to the party conventions. So what this examination revealed was that common media practices helped obscure many of the campaign's class-based goals and practical impact the, the experience had on those who participated, on the individuals who went to Washington. As a result, journalists did not just misinterpret the campaign, I argue, they also indirectly contributed to its failure by further complicating SCLC communication strategies in a chaotic post-King era. Both white and black journalists created or honed in on a handful of emotionally potent but misleading symbols for the public's digestion, symbols that came to represent the campaign as a whole. The most prominent, of course, was Resurrection City. The one, the one time City of Hope, and you'll get pictures, we'll show uh, slides that are much closer in. Uh, the one time City of Hope that, as the story went, had devolved into a dirty and debilitated gang infested ghetto. Other symbols were less dramatic, but just as media favorites were the mule train caravan, a plodding symbol of old fashioned Southern poverty. And <clears throat> the climactic, but sobering Solidarity Day rally on, Ju on June 19th, a one-day rally routinely compared to the 1963 March on Washington. All of these symbols reinforce several overwhelming perceptions about the campaign. One, that its most enduring quality was conflict and the ever-present threat of chaos. Two, that it was just another chapter of the black freedom struggle dominated by African uh, Americans and their distinct priorities. And three, that poor people but poor people were really black, not ethnic Mexican, not Appalachian white, not American Indian, not Puerto Rican. Ironically, the campaign's multiracial character, which was in a lot of ways its most radical aspect, uh, all but disappeared from public view. The media's hostility in the spring of 1968 proved a particularly rude awakening for SCLC veterans, given the organization's past success in using the mass media to achieve its own ends. 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., himself a product of the media in part, had viewed the press as an essential tool to redeem the soul of America. More than any other civil rights organization, SCLC had established its reputation through a sophisticated manipulation and cultivation of the press, much of it based upon King's charm and charisma. SCLC to great effect in Birmingham and Selma by orchestrating a stark contrast between mostly black nonviolent protesters singing freedom songs and white police officers wielding clubs and fire hoses and police dogs in that case. These powerful images combined with poignant but overly simplistic narratives beamed into homes across America and pushed many whites into action. As a result, legislation that eventually became the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 gained substantial legitimacy in the public conscience. But there were significant perils to portraying the movement as little more than a morale play. The simplistic good versus evil stage when fighting Jim Crow in the South did not translate well when taking on the more complicated issues of housing discrimination, income inequality, and the Vietnam War in the North and in the West. After 1965, King's unstated partnership with the national media became increasingly frayed as he strayed outside of often into their hearts, part of the roots of racial discrimination in Chicago, other northern cities, failing President Johnson's Vietnam War policy, and organizing an army of the poor to challenge the nation's economic structure. When King first floated the idea of a massive campaign during SCLC's August 67 convention. Press accounts reflected trepidation, if not outright hostility. Calling it a formula for discord, the New York Times opined that, quote, its mere announcement will give added strength to the powerful congressional elements already convinced that the answer to urban unrest lies in, in repression. And keep in mind that every summer, since 64 at least, uh, northern uh, and western cities had blown up in, in urban uprisings, right? Uh, and so in this August 67 convention, uh, Detroit and Newark, two of the most violent, two of the most destructive uh, of the uprisings had, had occurred within a month, right? <clears throat> the nation's major news magazines and the Chicago Tribune dismissed King more readily, calling the new campaign a desperate attempt by King and SCC to capture the agenda of black power rivals. Even the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Daily Defender, the nation's premier black newspapers, opposed the idea. March's demonstrations have lost their appeal, argued the Courier. In the present overheated atmosphere, mass civil disobedience would supply the spark that might ignite the powder keg. What good would it do? Media attention fixated on the campaign's violent potential and in the problem nor what the militants, as, as I have said, quality. Between December 67, when King formally announced the campaign, and March 68, which is when this picture SCLC's slow and I sharpened the campaign's focus on Washington, delaying its start to Congress Easter in late April, and more explicitly laying out its multiracial and class-based objectives. SCLC unveiled several tactical innovations, including an initial lobby in in which a vanguard of poor people would present their demands to government officials. Eight publicity-provoking caravans traversing the country, the planned participation of hundreds of non-black poor, and mass in government offices. Yet journalistic themes did not waver. In the campaign as a provocative departure from earlier non-violent efforts, a reckless attempt to shut down the government, and an all-black affair, the press framed the campaign as a referendum on King, black civil rights leadership. In a representative piece, a Times, this a New York Times article stated that, quote, the Washington campaign is aimed at offering Negroes a chance at more rational protest and at sustaining Dr. King's leadership. Now, most striking was the near erasure of the non-black poor from early campaign coverage. Rhetoric from King's speeches, SCLC press releases and an internal memos explicitly reference the participation of ethnic Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, American Indians, and Appalachian whites. By early March, SCLC aides had made considerable progress tapping into these minority communities. Yet journalists routinely failed to link uh, civil rights and the campaign to the era's other social justice movements. Quote, Time and Newsweek responded to the dilemma with editorial silence, 
rights law journalism scholar Richard Lentz, adding that their articles about the Chicano movement made no mention of King or the campaign. Even a canceled meeting between King and a fasting Cesar Chavez went unreported. Treatment of the so-called minority group conference spoke volumes. Concrete commitments from Mexicans and other minorities increased notably after the one-day conference held March 14th in Atlanta, in which King and his aides laid campaign details to a gathering of more than 70 representatives of the poor. The, then these uh, activists, including high-profile leaders of the Chicano movement, American Indian activism, and labor and youth groups and religious groups, shared their solutions to poverty, from land grant and fishing rights to protection of cultural assets, like language. Participants recalled it as a tense yet exhilarating exchange, one of historic proportion and perhaps the beginning of a, quote, bona fide coalition. Although SCLC officials did not press, provide press access inside this meeting, this conference, they heavily publicized the event the next day, including an impressive list of attendees. Yet only two papers acknowledged it. The New York Times mentioned the meeting in a six-paragraph story on page 36, while the Atlanta Constitution led with King's unrelated comments at the top, the first three or four paragraphs were about the presidential campaign and who King was going to endorse. Um, he doesn't endorse anybody, but they were pressing him to, to do that. In contrast, black and alternative newspapers, Courier, the People's uh, World, historic meeting of American minority group leaders. Three days later, King accepted invitation from James Lawson to speak with the striking sanitation workers in Memphis, a move that inadvertently allowed journalists to reinforce reporters' narrow frames of the campaign. King viewed the strike by both mostly black men as the perfect blend of civil and economic rights. But the Memphis days of mass rallies and protests in Birmingham. These large Negro community marshaled its forces the need to struggle for equal rights, the conditions, human dignity. Each day, long lines of placard-bearing Negroes, including many children, walk slowly along Main Street, all during business hours in an attempt to dramatize a boycott. End of quote. But while this narration seems sympathetic, it also subtly defined the fight by, quote, poor people for, quote, human dignity and, quote, equal rights as a black-only struggle. Memphis also stoked the media's fears that any King-led protests would end in violence. On March 28th, the melee erupted when about 50 youths out of 6,000 protesters began breaking windows along a march route, prompting a police response that left one child dead. The violence seemed to confirm critics' worst fears about the upcoming Washington campaign. News reports consistently linked the violence to Washington while campaign opponents intensified their critiques. Editorial pages called the Memphis Uprisings a grim warning and a, quote, carnival of law and urgently reiterated calls for the campaign's cancellation. The Washington Post canceled, uh, counseled King to consider cancellation following respectable precedent. Black newspapers had more mixed conclusions. While the defender stated that King took a gamble and lost, both the Courier and the Amsterdam News called those blaming King for the violence a, quote, deliberate misreading of the events. A, sni <clears throat> a sniper assassinated King on April 4th, sending the, sending the nation's cities, including Washington, into violent convulsions far worse than any nonviolent protest had ever sparked. Yet preparation for the campaign went on. During the next several weeks, new, new volunteers overwhelmed SELC's DC headquarters while a variety of one-time critics reverse field the support the campaign. Contrasting him to the more urbane king, the national media set a tone that expected failure. SCLC officials attempted to combat such characterizations in a variety of ways. For instance, Abernathy accepted the new Civil Rights Act in 1968 housing, but said it was, quote, not a solution to the problem, but merely a step in the right direction. During the next several weeks, he, Coretta Scott King, and SCLC aides defended the campaign as a necessary demonstration of Dr. King's vision, pointing to the many people who had since signed up, 
an explosion of support, both monetarily and, vol and volunteers, uh, occurred in the weeks after the Poor People's Campaign. This organization also deftly used Mrs. King as a sympathetic symbol, publicizing her pleas against the post-assassination violence and announcing her leadership in a welfare rights Mother's Day march to kick off the construction of Resurrection City. One article even credited Mrs. King for the concept of, the, of an anti-poverty campaign. SCLC also heavily publicized the campaign in black newspapers. These efforts dovetail with black newspapers' own calls for African-American unity and new efforts by the government to combat structural racism. Quote, beginning steps in the realization of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of complete abolition and racism in America and the world are about to take place, declared the Pittsburgh Courier. Meanwhile, Jett ran one of the few glowing articles on Ralph Abernathy and the leadership he brought to SALC in the campaign, pointing out that his rougher edges resonated particularly with more working class African Americans. Also, by not linking the campaign with the violence that racked more than 100 cities after the assassination, black newspapers undermined a key argument used by campaign foes. Instead, they looked to build upon the goodwill toward African American issues that had emerged since April 4th and the calls for unity from a wide range of black figures. But such rhetoric had one downside. By calling for racial unity, black newspapers compounded the marginalization of the campaign's non-black participants. Nowhere are the other folks mentioned in all this coverage after King dies. Aware of this impression, Abernathy and SCLC organized a golden opportunity for journalists to expand their narrow black-white framing of the campaign. On April 28th, a vanguard group of marchers called the Committee of 100 arrived in Washington to present the campaign's official demands. And although led by Abernathy, the diverse members of the committee did much of the talking with federal agency chiefs and members of Congress. Vic Charlo and Mel Tom, members of the National Indian Youth Council, read formal statements calling for greater federal action against poverty for all people. Latino organizers, Jose Ortiz, a Puerto Rican from New York City, and Maria Varela, a former SNCC activist and a veteran uh, from Alabama, and now, and, and at that time, a land rights activist in New Mexico, spoke of the failures of federal anti-poverty programs in their home states. Welfare rights activists asked for a more respectful welfare process, while white coal miners proposed a federal jobs program. One American Indian woman perhaps summed it up best. We don't want government handouts. We want work. And we don't like having to beg for what was once ours. The campaign's dramatic lobbying, as it was called, received in-depth attention from only two news organizations, JET and the hometown Washington Post. In contrast, other newspapers' reports routinely quoted and pictured just Abernathy. For instance, in three days of reporting on the committee's capital visit, the Los Angeles Times, which you might have expected to have a broader coverage because ethnic Mexicans, American Indians lived in the Southwest and in California. They, they published one photo, mentioned Abernathy in each day's headline, and quoted only the SCLC president, one of his aides, and two U.S. senators opposed to the campaign. As the first <clears throat> of eight caravans began to roll across the nation toward Washington, journalists continued to focus on a handful of themes and symbols. Born out of the Minority Group Conference and reminiscent of SCLC's 1965 Selma to Montgomery March, the caravans offered the dramatic spectacle favored by SCLC and the opportunity to recruit and build momentum along the way. But while journalists covered the caravans, only the three from the South made their way into print at first. Both the mainstream and American, uh, African American media filed daily reports as the caravans traversed through several civil rights flashpoints, including Montgomery, on the day that Alabama Governor Lurleen Wallace's body lay in state. Photographs of black marchers on Selma's Edmund Pettus Bridge and Ralph Abernathy in a carpenter's apron dominated daily news coverage. Of particular interest was the mule train, featuring 15 mule-driven uh, wagons, this one on the right, this caravan dramatized the abject poverty of rural Mississippi by using a universal symbol of sharecropping. The mules also offered moments for showmanship. On the left here, as Ralph Abernathy explained to a laughing crowd that the two lead mules were named after Mississippi segregationist senators John Stennis and, John, and James Eastland. Not surprisingly, the train became an instant hit 
with photographers, journalists, and the public. And Roland Freeman published a book about 10 years ago called The Mule Train, and he basically followed the mule train. All, and some amazing photographs that came from this caravan. But as vivid as the mule train was, it also risked reinforcing a racialized and regionalized understanding of poverty. Meanwhile, mainstream press coverage of the more diverse Northeast and Midwest caravans proved sporadic until violence occurred. Scuffles in Boston and then Detroit, uh, one involving James Grappi, made front page news. Ignored almost completely were the three Western-based caravans, starting in LA and Seattle and San Francisco although they best symbolize the campaign's multiracial and self-sacrificing vision. More than 750 blacks, whites, ethnic Mexicans, and American Indians made the arduous 3,000-mile trek across the country. Yet between May 16th and May 23rd, only the People's World and the Daily Worker ran routine progress reports on the Western campaigners. The Western caravans predicted was complicated by competition with Resurrection City. By the time one caravan left Los Angeles, for instance, other marchers had begun to build the tent city. From the beginning, Resurrection City had captured the imagination of reporters. Even before <clears throat> Abernathy drove in, the drove in the Shanitown's first stake in the shadow of the mall's monuments, reports of cost overruns, construction delays, and unhappy campaigners with the city's lack of basic facilities dominated news reports. After a few days, reporters felt mistreated by Resurrection City Marshals. The SCLC deputized youths who limited journalists' access unless senior officials were present. Thus, much of the reporting corps became fed up with what they saw as, quote, petty harassment, to quote one of the journalists, a frustration that emerged in their reporting. Daily wrap-up articles dwelled on the capital's imperiled tourism industry and the ouster of some Chicago gang members, while U.S. News, uh, uh, of course, um, maintained a message of doom, basically. Reporters pinned much of the disorganization on Ralph Abernathy. Even after the Western caravans arrived May 23rd, the national press continued to marginalize non-black participants, partly because ethnic Mexican leaders decided not to live in Resurrection City. Disheartened by the tent city's housing shortage, and muddy conditions after days of rain, they decided to move into a school about a mile away. At one moment, it, had, it rained 19 out of 31 days that spring, um, creating a, almost swamp-like conditions uh, in West Potomac Park. Only when land-grant rights leader Reyes Tierrina of New Mexico began to complain about mistreatment and exclusion uh, by SCLC officials did the press take notice. Four days after arriving, Tiarina called an impromptu press conference at the gates of Resurrection City. A skilled manipulator of the press himself, Tiarina recognized where journalists created and what grabbed their attention. Quote, black militants have taken over, declared Tiarina, and nobody else gets a chance to talk. That the first substantive recognition of ethnic Mexican and other non-black participants came in this context was not coincidental. Indeed, exactly once did any mainstream newspaper explore and print why ethnic Mexicans had made the trip. During the next several weeks, ethnic Mexicans received attention only when Tiarina or Corky Gonzalez, a Chicano leader from Denver, angrily demanded it. Of course, what Tiarina said was not true. Uh, you know, quote unquote, black militants had not taken over the campaign or the campaign's message. Um, but it definitely got headlines. Journalists covering the campaign spent most of their time in or near Resurrection City. This is a much more close-up view. And amid the reports of confusion and looming violence, reporters did capture some of the city's flavor. Newsweek, for instance, suggested the city had begun to gel, calling it a, quote, bustling microcosmic city. Own mayor, city hall, doctors, dentists, barbers, psychiatrists, daycare centers, communal comfort stations, juvenile, juvenile delinquents, urban, and urban blight. Time reported that the city took on a, quote, unique throbbing personality through a rich diversity of people and a high level of creativity that, and proclaimed that the entertainment was in town, featuring jazz trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie, Bob Seger, soul performers, freedom singers, revivalists, etc. The Post provided the best glimpses of life inside the city, declaring that it had created its, quote, own style. Tents sported slogans such as the, quote, the Great Society. All the, all the tents had their own names, it seemed. The Great Society. 
and the yeah. while soul music blared and old men played checkers. Adults lined up for haircuts. Children played in the Coretta Scott King daycare center. If residents did not meet during demonstrations, they saw each other in the mess line, in class at the Poor People's University, or in an impromptu workshop at the Many Races Soul Center, which was a cultural exchange sort of uh, space. Ironically, the mainstream press's most intimate portrait of Resurrection City came two weeks after it closed. Without sugarcoating the problems the tent city faced, black freelance writer Faith Berry wrote in the New York Times Magazine, that even though the, quote, anger and problems and sickness of the poor of the whole nation were in this some residents called it the only real they had ever had. By early June, however, even the occasional sympathetic story all but disappeared, particularly after the first report of an assault. Most coverage of Resurrection City became as critical as that of the students, which had bizarrely tried to connect the of Kennedy's assassination in early June to the lawlessness of Resurrection City. 3,000 miles away, but somehow they're connected. Rumors of rampant rapes, robberies, and assaults became news, even though campaign officials vehemently argued that such reports were exaggerated. Acute health concerns suddenly received more prominent play, and report after report told of people abandoning the city, never that daily to replace them included one reporter in private and sort of uh, epitomizes at least some of the attitude. Three-fourths of the people here in Resurrection City are just plain. Missing from this portrait of mayhem was the Hawthorne School, a private high school that offered hundreds of marchers a dry and uh, somewhat dry and tranquil home. Journalists at the time dismissed Hawthorne as little more than a segregated bunker to which Reyes and his followers retreated after confrontations with SCLC. But such portrayals oversimplified Hawthorne's significance. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, choosing Hawthorne was perhaps the most critical decision made by members of the Chicano movement in the two months they lived in Washington. In this space, whites from Appalachia, ethnic Mexicans from the Southwest, and blacks from both East and West broke bread, danced, devised protest strategy together. Some of the most stirring demonstrations, including an Indian-led protest outside the Supreme Court, began here. Wrote Mike Clark, official with the Hawthorne School and a Hawthorne resident, quote, I consider the Hawthorne School as important as what took place in Resurrection City, mostly because it was a successful, modern community. Many others who lived there with whom I conducted oral histories, I did about 36 uh, oral histories for this project, drew the same conclusion. Besides Resurrection City, <clears throat> journalists also placed considerable significance on the Solidarity Day rally. Held June 19th and initially designed as the campaign's culminating event, Solidarity Day instantly faced comparisons to the 63 March on Washington. Declared the Washington Day can be effective only if the march, like the Great March on Washington of 63, led by Dr. Martin Luther King, is conducted with dignity and discipline. Of course, the protest, or the contest, was different in 1968. Grassroots anger and frustration were far more intense than they were five years earlier. Thus, even when organizers and observers praised the one-day rally, comparisons to 1963 undermined the march's modest accomplishments. Turnout from the white middle class had been strong. The rally remained orderly, and images of thousands of people surrounding the reflecting pool seemed familiar. But everything else was different. And in the eyes of the mainstream press, Solidarity Day did not compare favorably. Missing, according to the Times, was the camaraderie, the Protestant establishment, the, quote, and promise. Replacing them was a, quote, a cool, apocalyptic, and signs that read, quote, this is your last chance for nonviolence. The Post pointed out how much smaller it was than in 1963. 50,000 compared to 250,000, although that number is probably closer to 75 to 100, but crowd uh, estimates are always contested, right? Solidarity Day 1968 concluded Newsweek was no match for the 63 March on Washington, 
In contrast, both black newspapers and their leftist and Spanish language counterparts uniformly praise Solidarity Day for its own accomplishments, particularly expansive Uh, women had no formal role, had no formal um, speaking role on stage. That was very different five years later. Only five days later, police flattened Resurrection City after authorities, citing 100 assaults since mid-May, refused to extend the tent city's permit on federal land. Accordingly, the mainstream press began to write the campaign's obituary. Most reporters then moved on, only occasionally returning to the subject, mostly to report congressional critics' wild estimates that the Poor People's Campaign cost taxpayers upwards of $1.7 million. I'm not sure how they came up with that number. A few jur journalists, however, proved more reflective. Quote, relations with the press have been complicated, noted Calvin Trillin, who viewed the campaign as a powerful metaphor. The campaign exists for the press. The press is a means of making the metaphor visible. But the more visible the metaphor gets, the more vulnerable it becomes. Vincent Burke of the generally critical LA Times agreed. Quote, historians of the future may render a more charitable verdict on the campaign. He wrote, the mere fact that the camp in of the poor took place means that it can happen again. Most blunt was, the New, was New York Post reporter Robert Terrell writing for Commonweal magazine. Quote, one of the most tragic aspects of the Poor People's Campaign is that it has consistently been distorted, misinterpreted, and maligned by the news media, argued Terrell. Quote, consequently, most Americans, particularly the white ones, have little or no concept of what the campaign is about or the problems that it has encountered. Poor people, goodbye, the press did you in. Of course, campaign organizers also shouldered considerable responsibility and many admitted as much. Officials underestimated the challenge of running a small city and that aspects of the campaign suffered because of it, such as dealing with crime and offering the press consistent access inside the shantytown. Perhaps most damaging was how officials, specifically of Ralph Abernathy's leadership. The media fascination with the campaign's potential for disorder, quote, was a problem because it began to direct how the staff was going to operate after the assassination recalled Kay Shannon an SCLC organizer. They were insecure, they didn't have a leader. And as a result, the organization made a concerted effort to quote, sell Abernathy as SCLC's new leader, trying to fill huge shoes, to make it clear somebody was in control. This often meant pushing Abernathy to center stage, the detriment of the campaign's leadership. This effort also translated into trying to over control the campaign's message, providing numerous news conferences, press releases through an extensive caravan reporting operation and talking points beforehand while limiting press access to Resurrection City itself. So such efforts reinforced the mainstream media's framing and although it was understandable that March officials expressed frustration with what they considered unfair media play, verbal explosions like Hosea Williams uh, proved counterproductive. If a perceived lack direction, harassment by city marshals, and poor weather did not sour reporters' opinions of the campaign, then being verbally attacked certainly did. Even if framed differently by the media, however, the campaign probably would not have achieved many of its goals. This is important to remember. Correspondence to the White House and national polls demonstrated a nation deeply divided over SCLC's attempt to refocus the nation on poverty. Yet more than any other institution, the fourth estate influenced what the public read and saw during the campaign's development, as well as by which standards to judge it by. The emphasis by the mainstream media, and to a lesser extent the black press, on Resurrection City, conflict, disorganization, black priorities, painted a particular picture. Rather than see the campaign as an attempt to shift from a race-based to a class-based and new coalition in the process, media frames strongly contributed to one interpretation term poor was just another word for black, and that this campaign was no different than any of the other campaigns for civil rights. Coverage of the Poor People's Campaign is just one example of such treatment. Other efforts at multiracial coalition building in the late 1960s faced similar narrow framing. From the United Farm Workers' Partnerships with SNCC, to the early Rainbow Coalition founded by Fred Hampton of the Illinois Black Panthers, bringing together uh, the Panthers, uh, Puerto Rican youths um, called the Young Lords and, and poor uh, 
why it's called the Young Patriots in, um, in the, the near north side of Chicago, attempts to broaden the civil rights coalition and include, and include other racial and ethnic minorities receive deafening silence from the mainstream media. None of these collaborative efforts were particularly successful, mind you, for a variety of factors. As I said before, a shared history of oppression did not automatically translate into, into sustainable coalition. Disagreements between African Americans and ethnic Mexicans, for instance, were often inevitable. But to portray these relationships as only ones of competition and conflict, or worse, as the media often did, to ignore them altogether, provides a pretty poor first draft or rough draft of history, I would argue. The men and women who tried to transform the civil rights movement into one for human rights, despite their shortcomings, deserve better from the chroniclers then and deserve better now. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, do, you, do you know any more of the, the story with that? Um, it wasn't just one. So, um, but what, it, it got disproportionate play, of course, in, in the press. Um, and often, so what happened was SCLC deputized a lot of youth, um, including gang members from Chicago, Milwaukee, other parts of, um, particularly the Midwest, as marshals, you know, to give them a job, to give them some um, authority uh, to, to help sort of patrol Resurrection City. Um, and they um, sometimes used rougher means to patrol the city than they probably needed to. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's sort of a he said, she said thing in the sense of um, the press reports, you know, I was just sitting there and I was trying to take a picture and somebody, you know, uh, clunked me over the head or pushed me, took my camera. Um, the reports from folks who worked for the campaign said um, uh, that it was not quite that way and we do have rules and we do have limitations on access to the, to the, to the city um, and you weren't following them. Um, so, um, as SCLC, Ralph Abernathy, uh, they sent some of these folks home. And I was like, well, some of you are more mature can handle this responsibility uh, better than others. And so a bunch of guys back to Chicago, uh, which again made big news. Um, so it wasn't anything, it, it wasn't like a knifing or something like that, but it was definitely some pushing and shoving uh, and uh, a certain amount of hostility uh, showed toward the press because um, most people who are affiliated with the uh, affiliated with the campaign really thought that the press was giving them a raw deal. So there was a, a certain amount of hostility to them. So, good question, yeah, Jane. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, for, for one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get a little bit more water here. <clears throat> um, I mean, much of the national press uh, was <clears throat> based east in the East, um, where uh, while they're Puerto Ricans, of course, um, it's not as in their face the multiracial. Um, sort of the, the, the mosaic or what have you, racial mosaic that is in the West. Um, so I think that uh, folks in a, in a newsroom in New York um, simply aren't thinking about ethnic Mexicans, aren't thinking about American Indians uh, very much. Um, that doesn't explain the LA Times, for instance. Um, although the LA Times, 
uh, had only become a quote unquote liberal newspaper in the in the early 60s and uh, and had many vestiges and many folks um, back to its earlier uh, ownership days which were really hostile um, to uh, really the the call for rights by any racial minority right uh, including African Americans um, uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, generally speaking and, and I've heard this talked about a little bit here generally, Tom. I know talked about it uh, a little bit in the media framing uh, panel yesterday and a few other folks, um, that uh, there was a big difference between talking about civil rights and poverty and freedom and justice um, in the South, where it's down there, and all those backward folks who don't seem to know what they're doing, you know, or aren't very educated and have this racial caste system and are treating African Americans like slaves, basically. Um, and that it, it's different to, to talk about those folks than to analyze your backyard, you know. Um, and uh, so I think that's very much the case when it comes to uh, the folks in the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Chicago Tribune. Um, that they're much more uncomfortable um, with with inequality, talking about inequality uh, in, in in their in their backyards. Um, they don't see it at the same level. You know, the racial caste system, the Jim the Jim Crow racial caste system in the South was much easier to look at and was much starker because of you know the signs and and uh, the you know sort of the morality play that was being. Uh, um, Presented in the media and me these media frames in, in, in Birmingham and Selma and Montgomery, um, <clears throat> and so uh, uh, and, and and the bottom line is poverty um, is is this much more complicated. Uh, many many good liberals, good white liberals, would argue that uh, um, uh, that well, if you have equal opportunity, and that's what they believed they had in the North, even though that wasn't the case. We know for. for whether it's housing discrimination, school, discri uh, school segregation, um, uh, police brutality, uh, uh, all of that, and, and, and the lack of job opportunities or equal job opportunities uh, in the North and West, um, you know, they would say that um, uh, you know it's different up here. You should be able to to make it here. So, I think there, you know, these folks were just much more comfortable um, criticizing uh, the South. Um, and, and far less so uh, their own folks, you know, but that's it. Tom. Great paper, great talk, and I admire you for the uh, <laughs> questions about where frames come from, and uh, obviously they don't only come from the media, to some degree raised to your arena, and his denunciation of the black belt, it, it sort of framed the march as a black march, but I'm wondering about Um, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's a really good question. I mean, and, and um, you know, the, the, of course, there was constant at, um, uh, uh, s stories <clears throat> giving a lot of space to uh, critics of the campaign, you know, in Congress. Um, I mean, President Johnson, who didn't speak much publicly about this, was livid. I mean, uh, livid behind the scenes. It's like, what do these people want? You know, I mean, and of course, that, that's a reaction he has, um, you know, when Watts happened see, three years ago. Um, so uh, there is some sympathy among his aides. There's some sympathy among um, federal agency chiefs um, that we could be doing more. Um, we, and, and, you know, I want to say that even though historians have generally dismissed this campaign as being a complete and utter failure. I also have problems with the idea of thinking of success and failure, because this was a really important. I, did, I'm not, I am going to answer your question, but um, this is a really important moment for Chicano activists. Um, Chicano activists see the Poor People's Campaign as being um, central to their own development and their own movement. Um, American Indian activists, same thing. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Um, uh, the a lot of federal officials also thought that uh, uh, this led to uh, the release of a lot of surplus food, um, changing policies by the USDA, 
um, by Health, Education, and Welfare Department, keeping in mind in a lame duck administration. But there were some policy changes that were made um, that incorporated more poor voices um, in their decision making for the second half of 68. Um, if Hubert Humphrey had won and not Richard Nixon, who knows? Maybe, maybe the campaign would be seen in a very different light. That's counterfactual. I'm not going to go there. But there's no question that there was some um, sympathy. But uh, generally speaking, uh, members of Congress um, who had become very conservative, even though it was you know, a Democratic majority, but of course many made up of uh, Southern Democrats, Robert Byrd, um, who I always think it's funny how he's been lying Right, liberal voice, you know, anti-war voice. Recently, um, was a right-wing conservative in the 1960s, and very, very nasty when when talking about civil rights. Um, so I can never get on board the bird bandwagon um, uh, of the, the 21st century. Um, but uh, uh, these are the folks were were quoted disproportionately, um, and. Uh, uh, bashing the campaign, bashing the poor, uh, and uh, there's no question that uh, journalists who have very well developed sources in the government are going to go to those folks, um, and a few of them are going to be maybe sympathetic and a lot of them are not. Um, so I think that, I mean, everybody is trying to frame this differently. Yes, healthy has their own frames. Um, and they generally fail. Um, they're not as good at it, probably. I mean, I, I would argue that, uh, again, because the complexity of the issues of poverty, the complexity of what they were trying to do with the Poor People's Campaign, um, because it was connecting, uh, and this was unpopular, of course, in 68, connecting funding for Vietnam to, um, you know, the, the bottom line is you have to get out of Vietnam to be able to fund the war on poverty. You know, the war on poverty was never fought. Um, it, it was uh, it, what didn't fail. It was never fought because its funding um, was a fraction of what it was designed to be uh, because uh, of the escalation of Vietnam, uh, and that's all. These are all connected to each other. Um, I would say that certain parts uh, participants of the campaign were quite good at framing um, their issues a little bit better. The welfare rights activists um, who sort of kept. In some ways, they were a partner in the Poor People's Campaign, but they also kept um, uh, SCLC at a distance, had their own news conferences, did their own meetings with uh, members of health, education, and welfare uh, uh, officials, um, or actually became a player uh, in federal welfare policy um, briefly in 68 and 69 were seen as, as, as players, and a lot of it had to do with some of the work they were doing in Washington um, during the Poor People's Campaign. So they were able to frame uh, <clears throat> their own issues about welfare uh, and, and dignity um, and, uh, to a certain extent, bilingual um, uh, materials uh, for welfare beneficiaries um, better than other folks. Um, and of course, Ben Gonzalez, they're also um, gets a lot of, uh, gets some play, he gets play in the Denver Post, you know, and the Rocky Mountain News. You know, here's the home, our hometown guy. Um, even though they were critics of him, he still got a good bit of, of, of play um, in, in the media there, you know. So there are these competing frames, um, uh, I think, and uh, um, as I said, SCLC didn't do such a great job in being able to clearly articulate what this was about, um, and the press um, uh, didn't help them. So, yeah. I wanted to ask about the image you had of Martin Luther King unveiling yeah. the campaign. Let's go back to and it. Whether it became associated with him so strongly. <clears throat> I was looking at the poster, and they are mostly black images. And I didn't know if. Others appeared with him. How big an event this was? Was it a big public kickoff yep. to the campaign? And how widely spread that image might have been seen? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So this um, was March 4th, 68. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it was a, basically a news conference by um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference folks, uh, King, 
uh, Abernathy, uh, Andrew Young, Bernard Lafayette, who you saw on the Freedom Riders uh, uh, video um, earlier. He was the national coordinator uh, of the campaign. Um, so that was uh, the folks in front of the camera at that moment were all African American. Ten days after this is this minority group conference that I'm, I, I mentioned where they bring all these folks um, from across the country, from different races and ethnicities and different backgrounds um, to fully explain what this is about. In his rhetoric, he talks about all the, it's not just black and white, it's all these folks. But there's no question that it's a little inconsistent um, when they do some of these news conferences. I would say, and if you see in the, in the far left-hand corner, that's actually uh, meant to be a Mexican-American uh, gentleman, right? Right here. That's a, supposed to be a farm worker. Um, and um, I, th I thought there was at least one more figure. Um, some of the other promotional material uh, becomes a little bit more diverse. But there's no question that um, at times SCLC is inconsistent themselves um, with, uh, I mean, Jesse Jackson um, makes a speech um, at the beginning, what is it, right before the caravan uh, leaves Chicago. Um, and you can see in the transcript um, how he stumbles over, you know, he basically is just talking about African Americans and then he, he's like, oh, and I, and I also meant, you know, our Mexican American and our, our, our brown and, and red partners, is the hell he put it. Um, uh, and there, there was also, Again, I would also say that um, Hosea Williams, who you saw in the very beginning, was always, and he was a part of the inner circle, very critical of incorporating uh, these folks. Uh, I was like, I don't want to sit you know, on some committee making decisions as a pair of a direct vote uh, with uh, some Mexican. Um, you know, uh, there was definitely this um, thread uh, that there were some El Junior partners in this. Um, so, um, SELC had some of their own issues. I would say, though, I, I give Abernathy and them, despite the, their challenges um, after Dr. King's death, a lot of credit for really trying to embrace um, uh, in the publicity through the Committee of 100 and that vanguard who goes to Washington before the campaign starts. Um, uh, I give them a lot of credit for really trying to reach out and, and, and include these, uh, include Tiarina and Gonzalez. Um, it only works part of the time, but um, uh, lots of questions. Yeah, back there. Well, yeah. Uh, have you have you often considered at all the fact that in 1968 was a, a very busy news year? There was just a lot of news going. On. Sure. Uh, and these organizations, like anybody else, you know, they only got so many people. Things uh, you got war in Vietnam, you got right. political assassination right in the middle of the thing. That that maybe that that it's just a matter of there's just too much happening, and the news media just had too many other things to do. Well, it's a really good question, <clears throat> and uh, but but the press is always uh, the, the press was always hanging out at Resurrection City. Uh, um, it's it's right down, you know, it, it's in the mall, um, and uh, uh, I would I, I wouldn't argue that there was a dearth of coverage. It's really it, it's really uh, the the tone of the coverage, right? Um, and and keep in mind before Resurrection City becomes sort of a swamp. And Rockefeller uh, uh, visits it. Um, who, of course, is a you know a major uh, is a presidential candidate at the time. Um, Hubert Humphrey visits. Bobby Kennedy visits. Um, this is a major deal, you know. Um, and and so a lot of you know, the, the press has a, a large press corps always around. There's no question that there are uh, distractions. Bobby Kennedy. This assassination happens right in the middle of it, and of course, some you know folks were you know they, they they wrote about. Interestingly, I mean, there was real differences in in coverage uh, about the assassination's um, uh, effect on the participants on the Poor People's Campaign participants. Some of them were like, "Yeah, it doesn't seem like anything has happened. They're just you know they're just going along with their business," which. I don't, I'm not sure where that where that reporter was, you know, because then other reporters and other folks, other oral histories I've read and have done have said, no, no, there was actually really respectful, you know, uh, moments of silence, and when the um, 
the funeral procession went by. I mean, it was you know it was this qu very quiet, dark day in some ways in the campaign. Um, and some people would say that it was a turning point, that really a lot of hope was lost that day for the folks that were in Washington, you know. Um, but yeah, 68 is a crazy year. Uh, and there's a lot going on. Um, but if you're going to cover it uh, and you're going to devote front page news to it, um, you know, why not um, actually cover the folks who are, who are there, you know, and, and, and not try to taint it and, and look at uh, just violence and conflict. Uh, and I think that's a problem. I mean, I, I really, you know, looking at violence and conflict uh, solely helped the, the, the movement in many ways early on. Um, but that, that becomes this obsession, uh, especially after the urban uprisings are occurring each year, um, becomes, uh, uh, becomes a real detriment, you know, and the media is not really a friend to the, you know, to the movement uh, anymore. So. Uh, other, uh, yeah, so. I mean, he's not the only one using law and order rhetoric, of course. I mean, he condemns the campaign um, and doesn't think that, you know. But, um, but so does Johnson. So uh, um, the Democratic candidates and the liberal Republican candidate in, 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 in Rockefeller are the folks that actually say the, po the poor people have a point, you know. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. I mean, um, it may very well have been. I mean, I, I think the law and order frame was around for quite a while. Um, and, and, and certainly, uh, it, as, I, it, as I just said, it becomes a real obsession every, every summer. Um, and the Poor People's Campaign was seen as this, this, oh my God, this is a provocation. You know, we're going to bring all, you know, thousands of, of, of supposedly nonviolent protesters who are going to be well trained and everything. Of course, the training doesn't ever happen because there's a certain amount of chaos after King's death. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the media certainly is concerned about that. And the black press is concerned. I mean, I think it's important, and I, you know, I talk about it in this, in this talk and more so in the paper, um, that the African American press falls into some of the many, many of the same traps when it comes to their framing um, uh, of this campaign. The worries about um, is it going to become violent? Um, you know, what's the role of black power in all this? Um, so uh, there's no question. I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I'm not a presidential historian, and so I haven't spent a lot of time with Nixon's speeches. Um, but I don't recall him spending a lot of time pointing to the Poor People's Campaign or something like that, saying, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> um, saying this is the kind of stuff we need to, to prevent. Um, he, uh, uh, because it wasn't, you know, remember there's a, you know, the, there's a, a small uh, riot in, in Miami outside the Republican National Convention, right, in July. Um, and uh, th there's a, a major riot in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, um, which I uh, wrote about uh, when I was still working for the St. Pete Times, um, uh, th that was linked to their sanitation. So, interestingly, St. Pete had a longer sanitation strike than Memphis's. Uh, it's not the best known, of course, for obvious reasons. But, um, so, a lot to contribute to this law and order frame. Um, in some ways, the Poor People's Campaign uh, really should have been on the list in that because it never ended up in the FBI. You want to frame it? Do you put it in a question? Gerald McKnight has a book on the hatchet job they did. Sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. No. Absolutely, absolutely. So, no, 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 point. So, I, of course, is, is providing frames, thank you, Tom, uh, for, uh, for their... Bierbauer, I think, gets his last question. It's not an absolute prerogative, but I think it's one that we're going to honor today. Uh, what, what I actually want to do is 
read a couple of these things together and the question of uh, he made very frank. I was sitting in Europe and missed the one just to have that, that distant view is what's going on? And what I'm really wondering is had we reached at some point of a degree of civil rights fatigue <coughs> and because you were in a political season it was shifting its attention to Vietnam. Right. Uh, because some of the, the, the unrest that, that started in 68 in Europe did turn Absolutely. Were things simply just shifting away as the other stories, which really tell this question back here, overtaking us? Civil rights wasn't compelling in the same way it had been in the previous four or five years. Well, I, th I think that might be certain, ex <coughs> excuse me, to a certain extent. Um, uh, I definitely think there's a certain amount of fatigue, you know, and a lot of, of, of white liberals are like, what else do they want? You know, what else do they, you know, do, do they need? And of course, I think that um, the movement is also shifting at that time. And that's one of my critiques is that this is not just a civil rights campaign. This is something that's much broader, much larger about poverty, you know, and it's a class-based campaign. And I think that's one of the problems is that a lot of people don't want to hear about class. Um, you know, uh, there are there were plenty of um, not a lot, but uh, but but plenty of of middle class and wealthy African Americans that were not as sympathetic to this campaign um, as they might have been to what was going on in Birmingham and Selma. Um, and uh, I think you could say the same thing uh, for any of these racial and ethnic groups. So I think that a um, certain amount of fatigue uh, kicked in. Uh, for the journalists, um, but again, the campaign was dealing with issues that were specific to the presidential campaign, um, and you know Vietnam was uh, a central focus of the Poor People's Campaign, and it, I mean they linked it you know, specifically to poverty. So it wasn't like you were making some huge jump um, from covering this one story to. Um, covering what was going on in the lar in, in elite politics and lar the larger campaign, um, so uh, uh, I, I think that's a good point. Again, as someone else mentioned, '68 was one um, crazy year, and so there was a lot competing uh, for journalists' attention. Um, but they were crawling all over the mall and, and Resurrection City. I mean, these press conferences were very well attended um, based on, uh, on the, the documents I've seen. And so um, they, they were, certainly were present. Something was going on where they, two or three people showed up, you know, in, in the case of reporters or journalists. So um, maybe there's competition for room, room in the paper itself or in the magazine itself. Um, but uh, they certainly, uh, the news organizations felt like this was a compelling story that they needed to cover. They just covered it a particular way that I think was misleading. So our first annual volunteer in Gala D, Farrell Award winner. Thank you. Thank you.